And, and that said, uh, we'll get to today's lesson. Uh, that's uh, a nice uh, way to introduce things. I will uh, hop to our uh, homepage for a minute and uh, take a look. Midterm week, I did post this. Uh, being the midterms are all online and uh, you'll be expected to take the tests. Uh, you will not, be, will not be having formal meetings on these dates to give you time to work on the review and the exam itself. Uh, so we will not be having Zoom meetings on these days. That is midterm week and review week. They are posted in the class. So uh, I put this on the announcements to uh, remind you that you, you do not have to attend a Zoom lecture on these days. This is when you should be working on your review and taking your midterm. Now on the calendar, you can see uh, the due dates are through the midterm, midterm, uh, October 13th through the midterm and a little beyond as well. Uh, so there's uh, that in the midterm. Uh, just to bring the attention, uh, we're referring to the um, PowerPoints uh, and you know where the lectures are, they're here. Lectures one through eight are on the midterm and then lectures nine through 15 are on the final exam. And I got through lecture 10 uh, when we talked about the YouTube channel and that's why it's not linked because I still have these to uh, narrate and subtitle. So uh, it can't really be official until they're narrated and subtitled as we go through them in class, they get narrated and subtitled on Zoom and saved uh, and then posted to the, um, the, the page. So you won't be getting any uh, information uh, that's any different. But Maria, it helps her uh, to, to review. And it may help you as well. And that's why I say you can email me and I can send you the unofficial uh, page where you can get those videos for further review. And of course, once they're done, I can uh, officially put them uh, on the page. It's just that they're, they're not quite done yet. So we don't want to uh, jump the gun. Now, today's lesson. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question. This is a uh, midterm uh, exam with a honor lock. Honor lock. Yes, the midterm is honor lock. The review is your own handwriting, messy or neat. I want everyone's handwriting. Uh, no copy paste allowed. Diagrams have to be hand drawn for the review. Uh, the method to the madness on that is tactile learning. Uh, a lot of times when you copy and paste, you scan it, you read it really quick, but it doesn't go from hand to brain. Even when you write, a lot of times you say the words as well. It's another layer of getting it into your head. So that's why I require the midterm and the final review. And those are assignments are required to be handwritten versus typed, copy paste type uh, answers. Uh, so I'm not worried if you have neat or messy handwriting. I'm not really going to grade you on the handwriting. I'm going to go through everybody's and make sure that they did a complete and thorough job studying for the midterm. Then you will get your 100%, providing you get all the questions answered accurately. And that way I know you study. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, bribing you to study, for lack of a better, bribing you with points to study, for lack of a better word. I've found over the years that I've been teaching, you say, Oh, here's a review, and some students will do it, and some students won't. Some students will say nothing on the review test, and some students will say, oh, that was the best review I ever had. 
But if you make everyone do it and give them points to do it, the grades go through the roof on the midterm when compared that you don't. So really, uh, the review, having you write it and turn it in is, I mean, it seems like a lot of work, but it really is a service to the students because midterm grades are um, notably higher when I do that versus when I don't. So really, um, it's beneficial for the students in general. Uh, the A students generally going to be the A student, uh, whether they do a handwritten review or not. But uh, I do notice the review, the, the midterm grades average about 15 points higher when you require versus when you don't. And to me, that's worth, you know, a class average of 15 points higher is fantastic. So uh, that's why we do the review and handwrite it. Uh, just to, may, a lot may of I use the book or not? We can use the book for the review, but the midterm is closed book, just your brain. So you got to learn the stuff. That's 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 school. You got to learn to take your tests. So that's why we do the review. So uh, uh, we, we will do review before the midterm. Well, I hope you do. I mean, they both have the same due date. I hope you do the review before the midterm. Yes. Ah, I by myself. I, okay, yes. it's not in class. Yes. No, not in class. <laughs> That's your study guide you're making for yourself. So you're learning it or relearning it or re-reviewing it as you do it. So okay. the quiz is actually uh, just the way we've done the first uh, quiz before. It's, it's the quizzes totally are all on... based on the readings that you're assigned. They the same as we the same as we've had that uh, before. Yeah, yeah. That's, this, the quizzes come right from the publishers' um, quiz banks. You get forty five minutes, et cetera, like that. That's yeah, the same routine. The quiz, yeah. Thank it's you. The midterm. That's a little bit different. That's the ninety minute honor lock exam. All right. And I'll address questions as we go along because the midterm's not due till October 13th. So there's no reason to hit the panic button right now. We'll talk about this at the beginning of just about every class up until then. So everyone will probably be bored by the time we get done talking about the midterm. Uh, but that's uh, the way to succeed is to, to know how to, to tackle this uh, thing. Now our image right here to open up the PowerPoint, the image, you can see uh, egg, this egg is floating on salt water and it sinks in fresh water. So adding salt to water increases its density. Density is kind of a, density is super important in science, uh, but it's an abstract concept. Most people define it with a mathematical equation. Density is mass over volume. But conceptually, that doesn't tell you much. Uh, I remember an old trick question for elementary schools was, what's heavier, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? And the answer is, they're the same. Which has more volume, though? Well, the feathers, a pound of feathers could take up a whole pillow. A pound of lead could fit in the palm of your hand. And the difference there is density how tightly packed the molecules are. In a uh, pound of lead, uh, a small amount is very heavy because the molecules are tightly packed. In a pound of feathers, it takes up a great deal of space because the molecules are loose. So that has density. Things that are less dense float on things that are more dense. So we have that density separation. That's why the atmosphere is less dense than the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is less dense than the mantle because it's sitting on the mantle. The outer core is less dense than the inner core. The ocean separates by density as well. Salt water is more dense than fresh water. So in an estuary, you have what's called the salt water wedge, where the salt water is underneath the fresh water. In the ocean itself, we have layers based on density. So this is just showing you salt water is more dense than fresh water. So density, density, a lot of times we 
just define it with a formula, but to conceptualize it, it's uh, a little easier when you think of the tightness of particles being packed together, uh, population density. A room with five students is less dense than a room with 10 students. Uh, 30 students, the students are close together. That's density. Temperature is the first factor of density. When you heat up particles, they vibrate faster. When they vibrate faster, they take up more space. So temperature usually increases the volume that decreases the density. So hot air rises, that's true because it becomes less dense than cooler air. The general space around a particle is greater when you vibrate it faster. It vibrates more. That's thermal expansion. The expansion leads to less density. So you're not changing the mass because density is mass over volume. You're changing the volume. A greater volume in the denominator makes the density less. A smaller volume in the denominator makes the density more. Now, density is a property that does not change with the amount that you have. So if you have a handful of lead or a room full of lead, the density of lead is not going to change. So uh, it's a property that doesn't change with the amount. So temperature affects density. It's inverse, which means it becomes lighter as you warm. Now, water is unique because it crystallizes as a solid, and those crystals have air spaces, so solids are less dense than liquids when it comes to water. We discussed that last class, and the reason for that was the hydrogen bonding. So water is kind of uh, a unique substance because it has the maximum density, and here's the chart, the maximum density of water is about four, 3.98, about four. Here is the density curve of water. Let's make it nice and big so you can see it down. Here's the temperature. The density of ice is about 0.917 about 0.917, that's ice. The density of maximum density of water is one. So this is gonna float on this. So here's your maximum density. As water cools past four degrees Celsius, it gets heavier and sinks. So the bottom of the ocean would be about 3.98 degrees Celsius. The surface, you know, that gets sunlight is a little less dense, warmer. So warm surface water, cold, deep water, and then you have a third layer that intermediate. So the temperature, the layers of ocean, the surface is variable. The bottom, right around maximum density. And then the intermediate is a transition from warmer surface waters to the density. Now, uh, so that is the first property of water that leads to the layered ocean, density. And density is temperature dependent. There's the heating curve of water. The second factor, that goes into the density of water is salinity. Like the first image showed us, salty water is more dense than fresh water. So temperature and salinity, the concentration of salinity in water makes it more dense or less dense. The deep water averages 35 parts per thousand. 
You have concentration areas that are a little saltier, but they're isolated, like the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea. You have estuaries, coastal waters, that range from the 20s to low 30s, Tampa Bay being a coastal ecosystem, 30 to 32. When it rains a lot, you dip low. When it, it's dry, we have drought, it gets a little bit above but an estuary has lower salinity because of the freshwater input. The thing is, they're isolated. When you talk about the open ocean as a system, you're looking at the surface having some evaporation, so it has some salinity differences. Then the rest of the ocean is fairly consistent. You have a transition layer, much like you do with density, and much like you do with ten, uh, temperature. So the ocean's really three layers and it's separated based on temperature, salinity, and ultimately density. Uh, what contributes to the uh, solids and seawater? Again, chloride is the most common ion, sodium, sulfate, but all of these together make up the solid portion of water. The salinity is based on what's dissolved in the water. It's an ugly graph, okay? It's an ugly graph, let's have a look at it. This is the density of water with temperature and salinity. Average salinity is 35, and you can see at 35 and five degrees, your salinity is about 1.0278, okay? Because it's between the 1.28 and 1.27. That's more dense than one, that water will sink. So uh, at 34 degrees, you're lowering the salinity, the density gets lower. So at 33, you lower the salinity, the density gets lower. Temperature, maximum is at about four degrees Celsius. And then you can see the density gets, so basically you need to have your salinity and temperature to determine the water's density. It's an ugly graph, I, I admit it. I do, uh, we used to do a big exercise on, on this graph. Uh, Next class, we're going to do graphing the uh, ocean, and we're not going to do any new lecture material. We're going to work on uh, an assignment together. It's a little more complex. It's uh, graphing the ocean constituents. Uh, so next class, we're going to go over an assignment at depth, uh, uh, graphing the ocean assignment, and we'll get more experience reading these charts. But to this chart, you need to know the temperature, and you would draw a line across. You need to know the salinity, and you would draw a line across, and then you could find the density. Or if you were given the density, you could find, you had to be given two out of the three variables here. If you were given the density and the salinity, you could find the temperature by drawing your line that way and then that way. So there's three variables on this particular graph. It's a tricky one. I'm sorry. So the the density is is the the bands between the density lines? is the bands. Yes. So okay. density of 1.024 is anywhere on this line. So what else? the temperature you could find the salinity by drawing a line, making a point, and then dropping your line down. So with a salinity of 33 percent and a temperature of zero degrees centigrade, would that be um, 1.027? It would be between 1.027 and 1.026. Okay. Draw and so it would be line up and draw your line there. And where they meet, that's the density. Okay. So we could estimate 1.0275? Yes. Yes. Okay. We have to estimate uh, that last number based on where it lies. All right. So you have to be given two things. You could be given a density and a temperature, and then you would draw your line down and get an estimate salinity. 
you, you, you have to have two of the three variables to um, find out what it is. It's a complex graph, but the important thing to remember for a multiple choice test uh, would be density depends on temperature and salinity. The maximum temperature is about four degrees Celsius. The average salinity of the deeper water is 35 parts per thousand. The movement of water vertically and then on the bottom is due to temperature and salinity. We call that hydrothermal um, um, thermal uh, motion. We uh, thermostatic uh, motion. Ice now. Ice has its effect. When ice freezes, the salinity rises because uh, salt doesn't freeze, the water freezes. So your saltier, colder water sinks. So this shows you the vertical motion of water, deep ocean currents, Arctic and Antarctic. The most dense water is Antarctic bottom water, followed by North Atlantic deep water. Here's your intermediate layer. And then here's ocean circulation at the surface. Our surface is steered by winds. We're going to cover ocean currents in the future. The surface currents, you've heard of the Gulf Stream, the equatorial currents. The uh, you, you might even be more familiar with the North Atlantic gyra. You might not be, which is the Gulf Stream, the equatorial current, and the Canary Current. But everyone's heard of the Gulf, Gulf Stream here, which is pretty much uh, moving up the coast. It's moved up by the westerly winds and the equatorial uh, trade winds. So we've heard of that. We hear about that a lot because it affects our local area. You might have heard of the loop current. That's what moves in the Gulf of Mexico. But we're going to study ocean currents, surface currents in the future because they're wind driven. The deep water currents are density driven. So we're studying them today because we're studying the layers of the ocean. So our bottom currents are caused by the Antarctic bottom water and the North Atlantic deep water moving due to density differences caused by temperature and salinity. So this profile shows you the temperature and salinity, uh, the changes in the water, the deep currents. Now we have three main zones in the ocean. The surface zone, which is thin, makes up about 2% of our uh, ocean water. Sunlit, sun only penetrates a, a, in the clearest water, you might get 200 meters. That's it. Uh, so the surface is very thin layer. Clearest, best case scenario, it's 200 meters. Most cases it's less. The transition zone is the change from the warm, less dense water at the surface to the cool, more dense water of the deep. Uh, it runs anywhere from that 200 meter uh, surface zone to about a thousand meters. So it makes up about 18% of ocean volume. It's transition. So uh, the temperature changes, the salinity changes, the density changes. The deep zone makes up 80% plus of ocean volume. There's no light, relatively stable conditions. You, do, you know, we did see back here, there is some circulation. So it's got a little bit of variability from salinity and temperature, but it's fairly stable. Uh, we're about four degrees Celsius through most of it. 
We don't get light. We are about 35 parts per thousand salinity through most of it, or 35 parts per thousand salinity. So the deep zone is fairly stable. So we have our three ocean layers. Near the Mediterranean Sea, there's a fourth smaller uh, addition uh, due to the Mediterranean, but we're really not gonna cover that in depth. In this class, we'll mention it when we look at some of the profiles, uh, but we're not really gonna test and cover it a lot because we don't live anywhere near the Mediterranean Sea. So let's suit up in our pretend dive gear. Uh, this is only going to be good for the first 100 feet or so, but uh, dramatic effect. We're going to suit up, and we're going to start at the surface and dive. Go to the bottom of the ocean. Look at the water column. So the first is our surface zone. Maximum depth is about 200 meters. Far deeper than our pretend scuba diver could go. We'd have to get into a diving bell for the rest of it. Uh, and the first thing you notice is as you move down, light will start to disappear. It's filtered out by colors, eye colors you, you see, uh, but really it's uh, frequencies that filter it out. Our eyes look at frequencies, uh, see frequencies as colors. We call that light attenuation, light attenuation. So uh, the surface area can be warm, variable though, you know, during summer it's warmer, at the equator it's warmer than near the poles. There's light, so it, organisms are abundant in the surface zone because of photosynthesis. Uh, organisms use that light uh, not only for water, uh, for temperature, but photosynthesis and navigation. So uh, most of our living things are found in the surface layer. I mentioned light attenuation, light attenuation. Uh, that is uh, how deep the frequencies of light, it's given here is wavelength, a uh, wavelength uh, and frequency, velocity equals wavelength times frequency. So, uh, but I prefer frequency, uh, but it's given as wavelength here. And you can see infrared and red is a lower frequency light, not as much energy, can't penetrate deep. The blues, indigos and violets penetrate the deepest. So that's why our deep water blue is the main color because blue light and the, uh, and then you have ultraviolet, which is not visible. Uh, so our blues penetrate the deepest, the reds filter out first. Uh, so blue at light uh, penetrates the deepest in the water column, light attenuation. The surface, is called the photic zone, photic, P-H-O-T-I-C, photic zone. The aphotic zone, and then in between, you have the euphotic zone, E-U photic zone. The euphotic zone, there's some light, not enough for photosynthesis. It's also called the dysphotic zone in our text, I believe, D-I-S, dysphotic zone. Uh, but there's, no, there, there's light, not enough for photosynthesis, because photosynthesis, the light, is used to uh, break up carbon dioxide and water molecules, and then they are rearranged into food, glucose, and uh, oxygen is given off as a waste. That's what photosynthesis is. So the photic zone has enough energy for uh, plants and algae to photosynthesize. The dysphotic zone, low level light. So creatures that have really big eyes, uh, like the giant squid. Uh, so, cause they can see they're adapted for very low level light. 
but there's not enough for photosynthesis. So the food chain is whatever rains down on them. And then the deep, there's no light whatsoever. So a lot of the organisms related to surface organisms, but in the deep are albino. Uh, you don't need to have pigment if nothing can ever see you. A lot of the organisms down there have uh, very, very little eyes or no eyes at all, but very little eyes is the norm because bioluminescence is how they communicate. Bioluminescence is a chemical reaction that produces light. So they don't have crisp uh, vision to see high resolution, but they can see flashes of light and uh, those flashes of light, like the angler fish, it hunts with a flash of light. Oh, communication can be done via light. Um, so most organisms that live in the deep are bioluminescent. Uh, they, they create their own light. Most oceans that live in the surface, some are bioluminescent, but really uh, vision is important on the surface zone. And then that dysphotic or a, uh, that dysphotic Photic zone in the middle, euphotic and dysphotic zone, uh, big eyes because there is a limited amount of light for vision. But primary productivity, most of it takes place in the surface. Uh, biologically, productivity is the rate of photosynthesis. It's measured uh, by oxygen. Uh, when there's oxygen present, photosynthesis is going on because photosynthesis creates oxygen. So, you know, chlorine was used to measure uh, salinity. They can, you can measure the amount of chlorophyll in the water, which satellites do, and then relate it to productivity. Chlorophyll is what the algae have. You can measure uh, the amount of oxygen in the water if you're doing it chemically on a small scale. You get a water sample, you look at the oxygen, and you can extrapolate how much photosynthesis is going on. So uh, oxygen presence or chlorophyll is how we measure productivity. And the surface, obviously, because it has light, is where our primary producers live, mainly the algae in water. On land, it's plants. Uh, kelp, kelp is the most complex of the algae. The seaweeds are the brown algaes and such. And then the algae, the red algae and the green algae, and our phytoplankton, which are plankton that produce producers, uh, they provide the ocean productivity. Most of them live in the surface zone because there's light. Scattering and absorption uh, is what causes that light attenuation. It's scattered. I think of Tampa Bay in the winter, it's pretty in blue. It's because there's not an algae bloom, light can penetrate deeper. In the summer, it's brown, it's full of tannic acid, which is from the leaves, the mangroves that rot. It's full of plankton and light is scattered, absorbed and attenuated a lot quicker and it's not clear and you can't see as deep. You go to the beautiful Caribbean and you see it's blue and that's because there's less biological productivity uh, once you get off the reef. So the water tends to be clearer with less biological productivity and in very productive areas or areas that get a lot of erosion, you get a lot of centering, sedimentation and absorption. And what lives in the uh, surface zone? Just about it. A few fun pictures here. Uh, this guy, our seahorse, we have them in Tampa Bay. They live in the seagrass beds. They have a interesting tail that hooks onto seagrass. They, um, are the slowest swimming creatures as far as uh, fish go, because they use this dorsal fin. They live uh, in the same seagrass bed for life, uh, the same one or two square meters is, is their entire life after uh, their plankton stage. The plankton stage, the, the father uh, gestates the eggs, collects the eggs and has a pouch. Uh, they develop and then uh, they shoot the eggs out in the ocean current and the, the babies that hatch are moving and then they, they are dispersed by the ocean current and they settle down and grab onto the seagrass beds. And then that's where we're gonna spend their life because they don't swim very, very good. 
Uh, parrotfish, they're here. They uh, eat the coral reefs and make the sand. Look at their teeth there, they're choppers. They crunch on the coral. They digest the live part of the coral and they poop out the sand. And that's where our white Caribbean beaches and beaches made of coral come from cycling through the parrotfish. So it's kind of a, a gross thought, but still that's what happens. That's where you get it. Uh, sea anemones and other polyps are here. Uh, our, our crustaceans, which are really the insects of the sea, the most diverse animal group are here. Uh, marine mammals, uh, sharks, uh, bony fish, bony fish, echinoderms, sea stars, great ocean predators. Uh, you don't think of them as predators, but they got that mouth under and they crawl over and eat everything. Uh, snails and, and coral and whatever. And if, uh, our friend, the sea turtle here. So these are all uh, just a very, very small representation of what lives in the surface zone. So the surface zone only makes up 2% of the ocean. It's got a highly variable temperature. It's got a variable salinity and the least amount of water pressure. We mentioned the weight of the atmosphere is considered, it's called an atmosphere. Uh, so at sea level, you're standing at the beach, you have an atmosphere of pressure on you, the whole atmosphere pushing down. If you go 10 meters or 33 feet, you have two atmospheres because 10 meters of water is equal in pressure to the entire atmosphere. So every 10 meters, you add an atmosphere of pressure. Soon, the pressure becomes far outside of the range we can live. If you ever go deep sea fishing, some of you probably have Hubbard's Marina or whatever party boat or yourself, you catch a fish at say 38 feet or lower. You reel it up fast. A lot of times their gas bladder sticking out of their mouth. That's because their pressure, they're used to two atmospheres and they're pulled up fast and their internal pressure pops their insides out of their mouth. If you catch a really deep fish, their eyes pop out because their internal pressure is so great. If you were to push a human down that deep, it would crunch them because we, our body is adept to our pressure. Uh, so at the surface, surface zone, your variable salinity. Uh, at the equator, you get the most rain. So salinity is the least, but temperature is the most. At the tropics, you have the least rain. You, that's where deserts occur, right on these uh, 30 degree lines or so. You got your desert here, Sahara Desert, uh, very dry, arid, the outback. Uh, we'll learn about that when we talk about global winds. We're going to introduce global winds next week before we talk about currents. Uh, so we have these areas of very high pressure due to the global winds, which decrease rainfall and increase ocean salinity. So near the tropics to about 30 degrees, the ocean is a little less salty or a little more salty due to evaporation at the equator because there's a lot of rain, it's a little less salty. So salinity varies with latitude as well due to rainfall. Sunlight, photic, dysphotic or euphotic and aphotic, we mentioned that. So here, photosynthesis occurs. Look here, this little area, this little area, this is where you can have rooted plants and that's it. You can't have any roots here because there's no light for photosynthesis. So this little thin area around the coast, you can have your mango tre mangrove trees or sea grasses. Only thing out here you can have is plankton floating, floating. So uh, the area for photosynthesis is limited in the ocean. Here you can have vision. So your big-eyed squid and other creatures can live here. Here, bioluminescence is king because uh, there's no light whatsoever. So here's the different zones of uh, lit, of light in the ocean. Now, refraction is the bending of light. Uh, light's a wave. 
and is traveling at a constant speed through a medium, air. When it enters a more dense medium, the speed changes and that causes the light to bend. We use that because glass is a different medium than air. We can focus light using the lens. Water, also different medium, changes the path that light travels and bends it. You can see here, it looks like the pencil's bent, dipped in the water. So refraction of light occurs at the surface of the ocean. Light is bent. Another property that occurs at the ocean is evaporation. Cohesion due to hydrogen bonding holds water molecules together, but at the surface, individually, one pops off at a time. So uh, evaporation affects salinity and occurs at the surface only. Freezing, we talked about phase changing, freezing and not really boiling because the ocean never gets hot enough to boil, but evaporation also changes the ocean, uh, its properties at the surface. Now the middle zone, this transition zone, the term that oceanography uses for the transition zone is cline, C-L-I-N-E. An incline means you go up, a decline means you go down. To recline, ah, you kick back, you relax. Well, in the ocean, this transition zone has a thermocline. That means the temperature changes. It has a halocline. That means the salinity changes. And it has a pycnocline. That means the density changes. So this transition layer runs from about 200 meters, give or take, to about one kilometer or a thousand meters. So light's being attenuated. You have a little bit of um, eyesight, eyesight, it goes, it goes dark. So you lose all light through this zone. You also have the drop in temperature, the increase in density, and the increase in salinity until you get to the stable deeper zone. Water pressure is increasing. It's impossible for us to live there. We have to enter submersibles to study this. Things that live there usually have soft bodies because the great change in pressure in the water column. So their bodies flex. Our friend, the leatherback turtle, is the only turtle that can uh, survive this pressure change because it does not have roots and scales. It has a flexible shell. Uh, but look, a lot of invertebrates, big eyes, the largest eyes in the animal kingdom, giant squid have eyes larger than basketballs. Uh, so you have this uh, lack of a skeleton or a flexible skeleton that uh, thrives in this layer, large eyes, or no eyes at all. About 18% of the ocean, it gets cold, just uh, you know, from whatever temperature the surface is to above four. Once you get to that magic salinity or that magic temperature, down. And then the salinity changes from that unstable surface to about 35 parts per thousand. You're gaining one atmosphere, every 10 meters. Right here, here's the transmission of sound. Uh, at a thousand feet, you have what we call the so far zone, the highest velocity of sound here. The minimum is at, the highest is at the surface, sorry. The minimum is right here at a thousand feet. Uh, that's called the so far channel. The so far channel, Here's your so far channel at about a thousand, thousand. Uh, so if sounds bouncing up, it's reflected down. If sounds bouncing down, it's reflected up due to the temperature and salinity. And you have this clear path across the entire ocean for sound travel. Whales drop to this depth and that's how they communicate and find their pods. 
The California gray whale, for instance, uh, migrates to Baja, California to calf. She has her offspring and nurses them in the warm, safe waters off the coast of California. When the calf gets too big to nurse and she gets too hungry to produce milk, they migrate up the coast and use the SOFAR channel to locate their family units. So that is used by biological organisms to migrate and find their family. We use that as humans, the military drops its submarines and transmits sound waves for uh, communication and for locating other members of the fleet. So this SOFAR layer does have practical application. Down to the deepest, the deep zone, from about 1,000, 2,000 meters, here you're at kilometer, to the seafloor makes up 80% of the ocean by volume. So we also can call it the midnight zone because it's dark. Most of the food comes from dead bodies or dead plankton raining down. You also get at the very bottom near hydrothermal vents, you get chemosynthesis occurring. Chemosynthesis is the production of carbohydrates like glucose from chemicals like hydrogen sulfide that come from the earth. So you get biological rain falling down, organic snow and rain, or you get the upwelling of chemicals that power ecosystems with no light. Most organisms bioluminesce or glow. So here's some bioluminescence. Uh, bacteria living in these organs are often the cause of that bioluminescence or algae, dinoflagellate algae, symbiotic creatures. Here's uh, more bioluminescence on the uh, eye, eye cells of this fish. There's his eyes, there's his eye cells, like little headlamps. And then down its side, these bioluminescent jellies. Remember Nemo with his bioluminescent uh, organism? He wouldn't live there because of the pressure, either would Dory, but this guy does, and this is what he looks like in real life. Pin-like teeth to hold on to prey and angling uh, lures. A lot of light organs. This shrimp here, it actually shoots jets of bioluminescence out to distract a predator. So bioluminescence is the norm in the deep. Bioluminescent squid, bioluminescent jellies. Also, hydrostatic pressure is what keeps organisms intact. When you bring this organism to the surface, this is what it looks like. That's the blob fish. But when it's down in the ocean, it's compacted and looks more like a fish because it is held together by that pressure. More old, deep ocean organisms that uh, luminesce. So the properties of our deep ocean, 80% of that deep ocean is considered uh, be deep water. Four degrees Celsius, no sunlight, maximum density, stable salinity, fairly stable, high pressure. Here, is your layers of ocean, the depth, and the latitude. Notice when you get near the poles, you lose your surface layer because it's always cold. Here are the properties. Pycnocline, that's the change in density. Thermocline, change in temperature. Halocline, change in solidity, stable, 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 
variable on the surface. This illustrates the variability on the surface a little more accurate than the last when it comes to temperature, because in polar regions, you don't really have surface transition. You have all cold water. Tropical regions, it's generally warm and then a steep curve. And in temperate, it's changing. You know, in the winter, it's cooler. In the summer, it's warmer. So in summary, we have a layered ocean, three general layers. It is density driven, thermo haline is what we call it because temperature and salinity, salinity, um, salt is called uh, halite in uh, geology. So, Thermal haline means to temperature and salinity. Uh, here is the water masses of the Atlantic. Our deep layer is made from North Atlantic deep water, Antarctic bottom water. Then you have your intermediate layer, and then that thin surface zone. The net movement is called thermal haline circulation. We also call that the uh, ocean conveyor belt. Here's your ocean conveyor belt. Deep water currents are driven by thermal haline circulation. We're gonna cover surface water in a future lecture. Surface water currents like the Gulf Stream, the California current uh, along those lines. So that concludes our lecture on ocean layers. Are there any questions relating to our ocean layers? I have a somewhat abstract question. Um, do we know why there's such a prevalence for um, the necessity of vision in the deep or why bioluminescence exists? I mean, especially I think what alligators can sense with their bodies, why is, why is vision so big? Well, because you would, uh, first off, you would probably have the creatures living down there, uh, filling the niche from creatures at the surface. So you have eyes and uh, that kind of sense is pre-built in. So they've lost a lot of that acute vision, but still communicate, uh, lure prey, uh, safety in numbers, school using uh, light, instead of, uh, you know, like uh, bioluminescence instead of sunlight. Okay, thanks. Yeah, they would have, uh, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't have evolved in the deep and have eyes. They're losing that as they, they go deeper. Do we know of any organisms that did evolve in the deep? Aside from like the two worms? Well, those, those worms have the gutless, uh, the worms that chemosynthesize, uh, but generally speaking, uh, life, we think, we think life generally began in tide pools. So everything kind of came from more of a shallow environment down to the deep and then have evolved their unique features from living in the deep. But that's cool. That's cool thinking. I, I haven't really thought of that. Uh, I haven't thought of that. But uh Current thinking is life began in the shallow tide pools. Mm -hmm. Nothing would have came from the deep unless it was uh, streaming from the, the uh, like bacteria come out of these hydrothermal vents, which is amazing. So it may have a separate lineage, some of the deeper creatures. All right, well then, uh, Wednesday we will be going over the graphing techniques uh, a colleague gave me this graphing the uh, ocean uh, technique. Uh, I have uh, several other assignments I used to use, but she uh, asked that uh, we give this one a try. And I, uh, I thought, hey, something new is going to be interesting and, and fun. So we're going to get a start on that Wednesday. If you guys would all be so kind as to print out the 
uh, assignment graphing the ocean. I'm going to print it out and you know we'll talk about the ocean and review and do a few things, but then we're gonna get a start on that and see if we can't uh, knock some of it off together. Uh, that way uh, we all are successful on it. Wait, oh, sorry. Yes, Jalen? You want us to print out the graphing data assignment? I want you to print out the assignment so you have it so when we go over it next class, we can all get a start on it together. Like I said, it was given to me by a colleague and she asked me if we'd run it in class and give her feedback on it. She thought it was a brilliant assignment. And so I want to get I want to get working on it with you to make sure we're all doing it right so I can give her good feedback. Okay. Okay. So next class, we're going to do that assignment and get a start on it together. And then I'm going to release you a little bit earlier so you can work on it. But I want to make sure everyone knows how to do it and that we all uh, get the most out of it that we can because it looks a little more complex. Where do you get that printing? Uh, it's right in the class. Let me uh, go to a screen share here. Screen share. Let's uh, enter our class. And uh, here we are, midterm module, weekly activities, and that's graphing ocean data. Here's the instructions, the printable paper, and the worksheet. I'm going to print all those out as well, and we're going to get a start on working that next class. Then I'll release you to finish it. So next class, we're actually doing this assignment. So David, I know you, um, you, uh, you uh, are in a unique situation. So if you do not want to do this, it doesn't matter. This is going to be uh, a class uh, kind of work together on this. Next class. Thank you. OK. I have a couple of questions if you're finished with uh, not not about today's lesson, but I. OK, so um, as soon, I'm going to dismiss the class and then we will address that. But we don't want to take uh, the class's time uh, if it doesn't really pertain to them. So uh, class, you guys are dismissed at this time. Thank you so much for a, a great lesson. And I will see you all on Wednesday. Please print out that assignment so we can work on it together. Um, and the rest of you are dismissed. I'm going to talk to David and whoever else has uh, personal or uh, interesting questions. Nice to see uh, you back, uh, Adrian. Uh, I hope uh, your teeth are okay. <laughs> They're good. Oh, there they go. I'm glad that you you look well. Um, David, how can I help you? Um, I was doing a which wasn't today's topic, I don't believe. But the uh, question first was on page 142. Um, they talk about calories and joules. And is that is you, um, exactly is that the same thing? Uh, yeah, I can't hear you too well. You're kind of fading okay. in and out. So. Okay, let me get closer to the Good. laptop. That's better? That's better. Oh, someplace on this laptop is a, is a microphone. Anyway, calories versus joules. Are they the same? Are they just metric. different? What's the difference of those two? Joules is the metric system. Calories is the empirical. But they would refer to the same quantity or the same same concept. The same, yes. same concept. Okay. Yeah, joules is metric. Okay, let me write that down. Metric. Now the other question is, uh, in you know where there was a page one ninety four, they go over hurricanes. Okay. And they talk about the way a hurricane comes from the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, it starts out and then it goes toward the east using trade winds. Yeah, we haven't covered the winds yet. We're going to be doing that uh, shortly. Okay, just to preview, just a very brief question. When it gets beyond the trade winds, the Coroli effect. Now, when you watch it. Coriolis. Yeah, Coriolis. When you watch a weather report on Channel 9 or whatever, they talk about the winds and how the hurricane is migrating. Never refer to the Corioli effect. Yeah, that's not why it turns. It makes the turn because it catches the westerly winds. 
The Coriolis is why it has the rotational motion around the eye. Uh, it's why low pressure systems turn, rotate in this direction counterclockwise in the Northern hemisphere. We're going to study Coriolis effect. Uh, like I said, shortly, we're gonna look at it. Uh, it's very important in wind and water motion. Well, if you look in the textbook pages, it seems to imply that the Corioli does induce the hurricane movement to move to the north and the east as it, as it approaches the Gulf Stream and as well, it approaches Florida. Like I said, so, we're gonna cover Coriolis in depth and then you'll see. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're gonna cover that okay. in depth. Really though, it's because the westerlies uh, steer it. It rides the currents and the currents, the Gulf Stream is moved by the trade winds and the westerlies. The Coriolis is why it rotates around the low pressure system. Okay, that's gonna help me. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. No problem. All right, uh, Artesia. Yes. All right. So I had other um, questions. So, okay. um, do we know about because um, I'm always a little skeptical of you know doing things under like like humanity as a species doing things underwater. And I know that like underwater noise pollution has been an issue for some ecosystems. And I was wondering how. Um, do you know how the use of the SOFAR layer affects organisms? Well, underwater uh, acoustic pollution is, is detrimental. Uh, mm -hmm. Shipping uh, causes, causes that uh, a great deal. But the SOFAR layer uh, is, is used by the animals for migration, for location. Uh, not all, just, just, just ones that can use, use the uh, sonar and the uh, echolocation. And then our submarines use it as well. So uh, I'm not sure, what, what's your question uh, in, in this? Oh, I was wondering, do we know how our, sub, sorry, how, how our submarines use of the SOFAR layer and whether it like kind of messes with the other organisms that use it? Well, yes, it does. Every, all yeah. acoustic pollution does mess with other organisms. Uh, they have to learn to adapt, uh, but we would use it in uh, locating other subs because you can get, you know, you can send out and wait for the echo to come back and it will span a longer um, uninterrupted layer uh, around the ocean. So you can use it for long range scanning. Oh, okay. Like around the entire loop? Around, well, you know, there's there's continents in the way. So you, you know, if you run into a continent, you're out, but you can go uh, a great deal further in the SOFAR layer than you can, uh, in the surface zone where there's waves and stuff and uh and 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 like that because it's concentrated the sound waves stay on on course hmm. okay and another question kind of unrelated um regarding scuba diving again <laughs> um right. so you know in, in my apartment complex i have a pool and you know scuba diving sounds interesting i'm like deathly terrified of deep water so i don't know if i'll ever do it. But um, what I've noticed is whenever I go more than like three feet underwater, my ears hurt a lot. And is that something that is accounted for? I, I know my partner, her ears hurt, like if she goes like down more than like six, 10 feet, is that, would my head explode if I went scuba diving? <laughs> your head wouldn't explode, but you have okay. to hold your nose and push out. It's called equalizing. You have to go down as you go down, you equalize, equalize, equalize because that happens. Some people can never equalize and they can't scuba dive. Other people can equalize easy. Some people have dental work and the pressure messes with their dental work and it gives them pain and they can't do it. So everyone's different, but yes, every uh, the pressure does, uh, does account for comfort or discomfort depending on who you are. Also muscle cramping is common as well. Where? Uh, legs, calves. Uh, you have to, they have techniques where you can stretch your muscles out as you go deeper because the pressure uh, and the buildup of gases can cause cramps. I see. Have you seen those, um, those videos of people in, um, oh, like the centrifuges? 
Um, Decompression? Uh, Spins? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of this one specific one. It's like, well, oh, while they undergo like different, like, I think the, the record is like six or eight G or maybe 10 G. Okay, yeah, decompression. And how they, yes, okay, yeah. And how they do like those exercises, like to like strain their muscles and keep blood circulation. Is it like that? Uh, it's similar. You uh, basically grab your fin from behind and pull up and it stretches your muscles and, and uh, helps release the gases that build up in them. And the gases are built up also by pressure? Yep, yep, pressure. Okay. And that's the same as the, um, what causes the gases to bubble in your or blood? Well, that, if you rise fast, then the oh. gas uh, does that, you know? Uh, you know, rising fast is like uh, opening the lid to a soda. And then the dissolved gases uh, turn gaseous. Okay. So scuba diving can be dangerous if you don't follow the rules. The you know, because we are surface creatures and, and you're not on the surface anymore. Uh, so following the rules is important. But when you follow the rules, uh, it's it's fairly safe. I mean, driving on US 19 is probably more dangerous. All right. Are there any places you would recommend? You know, I we've been staying inside a lot and scuba diving seems like one of those socially distanced activities. Are there any places that you would recommend for beginners around here? Uh, you got to You got to get certified. Okay. So you got to take the courses. I, uh, my, my daughter, my daughter, my oldest daughter got certified at Bill Jackson's in uh -huh. Dallas Park on 19. Uh, a guy named Mike Love was, was good. Uh, so that's the only local one that I know of right now that does a, a really good job. Okay. And the Keys, you can get certified as well. And then uh, I have friends that went down to the Keys on vacation and got certified and scuba dove right in the Keys and kind of uh, uh, did that as well, did a, did a dive trip and booked lessons through uh, Conk Republic Divers in Tavernier, where they're a real good outfit. And uh, there's one in Isla Mirada, uh, too, that you go down and you take your classes and they take you out and teach you how to scuba dive and you actually do them uh, out, out in the Atlantic, which is pretty exciting. Oh. All right. Well, cool. Thank you so much. Um, oh, you're more than welcome. You have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye now.